Hey guys, welcome to Thinking Theology. I'm Don. As promised, I am now going to be doing, you know, a series of videos, quite a number of them actually, shorter snippet bite-sized videos of one element of Trinitarian dogma and why I don't think it makes sense. So I'm going to present that to you and then you do with it what you will. But this one is about how we as humans process reason and how our experience ties into how we formulate our beliefs and what we're willing to believe. And I'm going to be doing that in relation to the word persons as it's used in Trinitarian theology. And I'll start with a few verses, just these are from the New Testament, but um, keeping in mind that the backdrop to all of this is Deuteronomy 6.4, which is known as like the Shema of Israel, the basic foundational text. And that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And if we assume that that word one means one independent creative being or person, then we've got one, okay? And these verses that I'm going to just read from the New Testament, as far as the word persons or the conception of a being goes, are readily understood in relation to God. John 14, 1 says, and, and this is, mind you, this is reportedly Jesus is speaking, okay? So these are the recorded, ostensibly the recorded words of Jesus speaking. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, mind you, he's saying that right there, there's a lot in there. But he's saying, you, you believe in God. He said, well, also believe in me. But he didn't say believe in me as God also. What he was, actually, it's possible, according to that, to believe in God, but not believe in Jesus. That doesn't go against our common conception of personhood, if you will. Acts 2.36 says, Therefore let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. All right, so here we have, let the house of Israel know surely that God, it doesn't say God the Father, it doesn't say God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it just says God made Jesus Lord and Christ. So what you've got there is a clear superiority, if you will. You've got a, a subordination where one was made something by one greater than himself. And there's no confusion in our conception of what the word person might be there. So, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, and da 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 So we've got one God, the Father. Now, this was in a polytheistic world. And Judaism was unique when it was, if you want to say, introduced into that world, that there was one God. Okay, this was a polytheistic, pantheistic world. The Greco-Roman world, there were a multitude of deities. And you're familiar with some of the names now, Zeus and, and so forth, where there are major deities, minor deities, and so forth. And Paul even says that in Corinthians. For there are gods many and lords many, but to us there is one God, the Father. So Paul is even continuing this in his letter to the Corinthians so that idea of God being like one person, that being the Father, and then everything else being subordinate, it remains intact according to the, our sense of what it is for one person to be above another when we live out our lives here on earth. It comports with that conception. And then in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and these could be multiplied easily. They're all throughout the New Testament, so just pay attention on your own to it. But in 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So again, you've got one God, and then you've got another being, Jesus, as serving as a mediator between that very same God and men. And he's referred to as a man here, of course, the man Christ Jesus. So this gets into and it speaks to the importance of defining our terms when we speak, when we're trying to form a, a, a thought relating to some spiritual concept. And, and, you know, spirit generally just means when we say something is spiritual, 
it isn't as <laughs> concrete, physical. You can't touch it. You can't poke it. It's more amorphous, if you will. So the def defining of terms is that much more important. But it is going to be based on our experience here. That's all we've got to have to relate to these words. So, for example, I'll just give this as an example. Sometimes you'll see like a bunch of cars parked real close to one another. And there'll be like one in the middle and you're like, oh, that person can't get out. And like, because they're so jammed in there, right? And so you're standing with a friend and you come upon a parking lot. And, you know, maybe it's a tailgate at a football game or, you know, wherever. And you see a car in the middle and they can't get out. And you say to your friend, like, my God, how did that thing even get in there? And he says, well, when we were, you know, down the other block, it floated in there. And you would start laughing. You'd be like, ah, good one. Where are you going with that stupid comment? Because cars don't float. That's not our common experience. So when somebody presents something to you that goes against everything you've experienced, you naturally say, yeah, that, that didn't happen. There's some other explanation for that car getting in the middle. So that same approach, that same line of reasoning, the same way that we go about forming our beliefs about what's going on and what we're willing to accept as true or even possible also applies to the use of the word persons as it's used in Trinitarian theology, or the word three, or the word one, our common understanding of three and one, our common understanding of the word persons is relevant. And in Trinitarian theology, this word persons is never clearly defined. It is said, and this is a common argument in Trinitarian theology, that the word person or persons is not used according to its usual signification or its common usage but an alternate under definition is never given of that word persons. So when it's said that there are three persons, each of whom is fully God, then what that tells us is that there are three gods. And that is part of the problem with the Trinitarian line of reasoning is that then it's just said, well, no, there's not three. That's not what we mean. What we mean is that there's only one. They blend in there in a mysterious way. That's why it's a mystery that you just take it on faith. Don't think about it. And my take on that is that, no, we actually need to think about things. It's the mechanism by which we can not believe things that are absurd or damaging. But some will say, some eminent Trinitarians over the um, millennia have said, no, we do mean this word persons in the normal way. There are absolutely three gods whom we worship, the same as three different people, where that word persons mean, you know, God the Father is his own separate God. God the Son is his own separate God, there, and God the Holy Spirit. And so that is tritheism, and that is rejected by most Trinitarians. So the next step in defining or trying to explain this word persons is to well, another prong in Trinitarian ideology is to say that God exists as three modes, or there are three personas of God in this sense. He, sometimes he appears as God the Father, sometimes he represents himself as God the Son, sometimes he represents himself as God the Holy Spirit, depending on what he's doing. So it's just three separate modes of the same being. That's what's known as modalism, and that is also rejected by the majority of eminent Trinitarian theologians because the doctrine of the Trinity says that there are three separate persons in the Godhead. And so when there's no explanation of what you mean when you use a word like persons, it's very much like the way you'd use the word float in relation to a car. It's like, well, they don't go together. So three persons in one being, those concepts don't go together. So I just wanted to point out that when you're thinking on your own of how this theology is sort of fused together, and if you know, you're a Bible student, you studied the Bible, those words do mean something, and you ought to seek for clarification as to what they mean, because that's what we do in our ordinary everyday life, and that relates to how we should think about anything.
Like there's not this special realm of thought that, or the abandonment of thought and reason that we should enter into when trying to contemplate things about God or Jesus. Because then we, we could say anything that we wanted to and expect others to assent to it. I hope that made sense to you. So leave your comments, questions, and I'll get to them eventually. Um, maybe I'll bump them up the list if one is especially intriguing. All right, have a great day, guys. Keep thinking theology and be nice to one another, even if you disagree.